Welcome to Creeped Out, a channel dedicated to scary stories. Some are true, some are from the imagination, some are from your dreams, others are from your nightmares. The following true story took place when I was a teenager in the early 1980s. I grew up in Pinellas Park, Florida. Now some people, like my brother, love Florida and would never, ever leave. I am not one of those people. I never cared for Florida for a whole list of reasons, which I won't get into here. One day when I was the last child in the house and my mom had retired early from her job, she suggested we move to the west coast to live with my aunt and uncle in a small cabin in the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon. Enthusiastically I agreed and could hardly wait for the day we would get on the bus and kiss Florida goodbye. The bus ride took five days, which I didn't mind since I had never been outside of Florida since my family moved there when I was two years old. So I had never seen a big city, a small farm. I hadn't even seen snow, so naturally I was quite excited. My aunt and uncle met us at the truck stop in Baker, Oregon, and drove us to their cabin, which was situated just outside of a little town called Granite. Now, Granite was a gold rush town, which saw its heyday back in the mid-1700s and ended somewhere in the mid-1800s. Now, there were a few people that never left, but the minor resurgence of new residents wouldn't begin until the late 1970s. People would buy up the various houses, saloons, and shops, which included the land they sat on for next to nothing and then they would refurbish them back into rustic vacation homes. The ones who had already made their fortunes retired and lived in granite for the rest of their days, and the house would remain in their family for generations, but the year-round population of the town was only about 18. Not 18,000, not 1,800, just 18 people, and that includes children. My cousin Linda and her husband, Mike, lived in the same little ghost town where they ran a combination tavern and general store. It became very popular with the locals and would probably still be there today if it hadn't been burned to the ground in a middle of a humid summer night. The fire almost killed my cousin and her husband who lived above the tavern. Fortunately, they got out just in time. They tried to put out the fire but with only two of them, the fire just raged until the very last ember had died out. Everyone was heartbroken at the loss of the much-loved tavern. There were suspicions in and around town about how the fire started, but nothing could be proven. I'll just say that the prime suspects were people who gave all the other residents a hard time whenever they would cross paths. Literally no one liked them. There were several attempts by others to start a new store, but it was never the same without Mike and Linda, who had moved back to the big city. So each one of the businesses would eventually, sadly and quietly, close their doors forever. Now back when the original Vibrant Tavern was still standing, there was a building across the street, about two doors down. It was creepy run-down, dark, and frankly a deserted house. It always gave me a strange vibe whenever I had to walk past it, so I would go out of my way to avoid it whenever I was out walking alone. In the summertime, the kids around town would hang out together, and our parents would let us stay out after dark. After all, in a small town, and so far removed from the big city, what could possibly happen? That question would be answered soon enough. One summer night, it was time for our little band of misfits who had been out all day 
to make our way up the steep dirt road which led up the hill back into town. At the top of the hill we turned right which would of course lead us past the dreary old house and one lonely street light was all that lit the area in front of it. We stopped in front of the building and each of us tried to get one of the others to enter the creepy rundown shack. Suddenly I got this eerie vibe which seemed to come from the house, so I looked up at the top floor to see a face highlighted by the street light. <sighs> I could almost feel the color drain from my face as I looked back at my friends and tried to explain what I'd seen. Even though no one else saw it, they knew I was serious. By now it was getting very late and everybody was creeped out already. So we all agreed to come back the next day to check the place out. The next day came and we all gathered together to climb the rocks and hills outside of town looking for old abandoned mines and campsites where hopefully we would find some sort of treasure or artifacts, maybe even gold. We never found anything of value of course, but the exploring was the fun part anyway so no one ever complained if we returned empty handed. When it was almost noon, we decided it was time to head home to fill our bellies, but not before we tested our bravery in the perceived safety of broad daylight by entering the worn down old house. So up the hill we went at an excited, hurried pace. However, our pace slowed a little bit with each step that took us closer to the front door of the abandoned weathered house until we finally reached the entrance. We stared at the door for a bit, and you could feel the tension and the sense of dread in each of us as we worked out who would open the door first. One of the girls, who frankly was probably more brave than us boys, decided that she would be the one who would dare to enter first. With a bit of worry on her face, she slowly grabbed the doorknob and gently turned it. When it wouldn't open, everybody breathed a sigh of relief and relaxed as if a bomb had been disarmed. Then, one of the boys had the brilliant idea for us to try finding another way in. So, we decided to split up and circle the building and meet in the back. But before we got to the rear of the building, one of the boys yelled that he had found a way in. So we ran as fast as we could to the other side of the house, only to see the narrow crack in the wall which, of course, was just big enough for a kid to fit through. This time it was one of the boys who decided to take the first steps into the unknown that awaited us inside. Once we were all inside, we just stood there for a moment in the stillness and silence that surrounded us. I think we were all amazed that we found the courage to enter the dusty, creepy, tomb-like, run-down shack. As we shuffled around the first floor, we all felt a little more bold since the dusty building was completely, at least apparently, empty. After wandering around a bit, I eventually found a set of old creaky dirt covered stairs and after a bit of hesitancy, we all started up to the second floor. Midway up to the second floor, we all heard a woman's laughter that faded into the silence. We almost turned around and left after that because we thought that there were adults there and that we'd be in trouble. We waited for a few seconds and when we didn't hear any other sounds, we decided to continue up. When we reached the second floor, we had a brief moment of relief since there was only an old mattress and some odds and ends laying around but no one was there, which immediately raised the hair on our necks as we realized that given the history of the building and the eerie laughter we heard, it was probably haunted. After that realization, we all paused for a moment to gather up our courage and hurried up the rickety old stairs to the third and final floor, where again we saw it was empty and abandoned. Not even a single bird had nested there. That was our final sign to turn around and get out, back to the safety and warmth of the sunlit streets. But as we were about to leave, someone noticed a closet across the room, so of course we had to check it out. 
This time I was the lucky one to open the closet door first. I got the same feeling you get right before you jump into the deep end of a cold swimming pool. After a moment's pause, I took a deep breath and quickly grabbed the handle and with a sharp jerk, I pulled on the door, but to my surprise and relief, it wouldn't open. Each of us took a turn, but could only manage to open it just a crack. One of the other boys dared me to stick my hand through the crack into the ominously dark closet. Slowly, I put my hand through the crack as if I were putting it into a mouse trap. Suddenly, I felt something claw at my hand and it felt like bony fingers trying to grab me. I quickly jerked my hand out of the closet as fast as I could. When I told them what had happened, everyone could tell by the tone of my voice and the look on my face that I was not kidding when I said that something had touched my hand. After I calmed down and we all regained some sense of bravery, we each took a turn trying to open the closet door completely, but none of us could do it on our own. So two of the other boys gave it a try and together were able to pry it open. And to our amazement, we saw absolutely nothing. The closet was completely empty except for a few cobwebs. At first, it was a letdown, but then we realized that someone or something was messing with us and probably didn't want us there. Suddenly, a chilling, hair-raising feeling passed through my body. I don't know if any of the others felt it, but we all agreed it was best to leave right away and never tell our parents about our trespassing. After a year or two, we moved away from that old town, so I don't know if any of those residents ever did anything with that old house. I can only say with great certainty that I will never return to that haunted house that sits on a hill in a lonely old haunted mining town called Granite. Oregon.